morning, guys. Good morning. I can't believe it's uh, July 30th. Summer's like, I mean, the kids going back to school are saying, summer's over. Oh, my God. It doesn't feel like the summer began. Anyway, so we're going to kind of pick it up where we left off. Uh, and we're gonna, I'm going to provide you with an overview of treatment uh, of uveitis. So, uh, fundamental to, us, to treating uveitis is establishing a diagnosis, okay? So, as we were talking about uh, last time, it's really essential to establish a diagnosis, even if it's idiopathic, to exclude an infection or malignancy. Um, that uh, if you have an infection, you treat with the appropriate antimicrobial uh, therapy, um, and then a, if it's a non-infectious, um, there are disease-specific indications for treatment, which we're going to kind of um, go over a little bit. And then a kind of a step ladder algorithm. I hate the word algorithms, you know, in UVS because really therapy is individualized to the patient, okay? But it's a, an approach. It's an, uh, basically a kind of philosophy of taking care of patients. I think one should always be willing to step back, reconsider your diagnosis, particularly if you have an atypical response to treatment, um, or if new findings emerge, because the diagnosis may be different, or you actually may be treating something that uh, you don't want to be treating. So the goals of treatment, okay? You want to, we want to eliminate inflammation with prompt uh, control of acute activity, suppress chronic or recurrent disease, and, and an attempt to reduce, uh, induce remission, which is difficult to do in a lot of patients with uveitis. Um, we want to prevent, um, in, in, this whole uh, approach is an effort to prevent, reduce ocular structural complications which can re interfere with vision, um, uh, such as cataract, macular edema, scarring, cordial scars, um, and to uh, minimize uh, potential systemic complications or ocular complications of therapy. So in essence, we want to have our cake and eat it, um, but I, and I think that in many cases it's possible, but it takes some, some doing and a little bit of, um, you know, uh, empiric therapy sometimes. So the stepladder approach, basically, very broadly speaking, is we start out with steroids, okay? Steroids are the first line treatment for patients with uveitis. Um, frequent steroids, uh, topically uh, or systemically, um, uh, but for anterior segment inflammation, topical steroids with cycloplegics. I don't really use oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications very often, except when they are indicated uh, for a patient that already has disease for which they're taking it, uh, such as uh, certain types of spinal arthropathies, in which I think in some cases it may be somewhat steroid sparing. Uh, then periocular and intravitreal steroids, um, which we'll go over brief. Systemic steroids, you know, dividing the length of time uh, with, uh, with uh, oral prednisone, usually about a, a milligram per kilogram tapering. And then the early implementation of steroid sparing immunomodulatory therapy in patients that um, are not responsible for developmental side effects. And then finally, there is, uh, there is I think, a role for vitrectomy uh, in uveitis, although that is re really not well-defined therapeutically. That is. So we have uh, the route and the choice of medications really determined by the anatomic location we were talking about last time of the inflammation, um, the uh, ocular comp complications that can induce, and really the systemic health of the patient. So topical steroids, for example, are, are adequate for purely anterior uveitis, but they will not penetrate to the back of the eye. So here are our choices, topical, periocular, implantable devices, systemic steroids, immunomodulatory therapy. Um, we, use, we use them depending upon the uh, location of the, of the uveitis, so in anterior uveitis, topical steroids are really the, the, the choice. In intermediate uveitis, usually, uh, you know, we begin with periocular injections and sometimes systemic diseases, and then advanced therapy is needed. Posterior uveitis, similarly, and then pan uveitis, is, you know, inflammation affects all uh, segments of the eye that we can use. We have everything available to us. So, just topical steroids. I, I don't want to insult your intelligence or anything like this, but, um, you know, I, when we Use topical therapy. Use it if you have inflammation in the eye. Use it frequently enough to put out the to put out the fire, to put out the inflammation. So don't start out with BID topical steroids. 
treated uh, frequently, a high dose uh, delivered directly of the anterior segment, uh, and then once the inflammation is under control, taper it, uh, sometimes slowly, depending upon the disease, but taper it, and then, um, uh, and then just continue. Um, there is limited delivery of the posterior segment with the exception, in the exception of a couple of situations. So diflupredinate um, does have pretty good uh, posterior segment delivery. A caution about that is four, time, four times more potent than, uh, than Predforte uh, and is much more steroid uh, side effect inducing with, steer, with uh, elevated intractable pressure and cataract. Uh, and it particularly uh, produces those problems with in children. So, uh, the other thing is that in a vitrectomized <coughs> eye, you may have better drug your, you may have better posterior segment penetration of, of all drops. So, non steroidals as well. So, as I was saying, you start out with high frequency taper over about six to eight weeks. Uh, frequently, we will employ cycloplegia in the cases of anterior uveitis to for comfort for the patient to avoid ciliary body, body spasm and also um, to prevent uh, sneakia. I prefer to use a shorter acting cycloplegic, such as a homotropine or, a cy or cyclogel, cyclopentylate, to move the pupil rather than to keep it in a fixed dilated position, where I think sneaky would be more apt to perform. To perform. Um, regional steroids are, uh, provide local sustained delivery for about three to four months and minimize systemic adverse events, and they're very useful, particularly in acute non-remitting disease that is unilateral particularly intermediate uveitis. Uh, and I, the contraindications are obviously an infectious disease, so you would never want to administer a uh, periocular or intrauterine steroid in a patient that has toxoplasmosis or in whom you might suspect of having ARN, uh, scleritis, or I, I, you would be loath to uh, do this in your circumspect in a patient that has a really large steroid, high steroid responder. So the preparation we most often use is uh, triamcinolone acetate of 40 milligrams per mil. You can deliver it either in a posterior subtenons injection or an orbital floor and they have equal efficacy. Um, it is effective in both reducing inflammation and in uh, macular edema uh, in, in about greater than 50% of the time and there is additional benefit for repeated uh, injection. There is of course the uh, risk of steroid-associated uh, side effects of cataract and intraocular pressure, which are not actually minimal. Similarly, with intravitreal uh, corticosteroids, triamcinolone acetate has been uh, used most frequently at two to four milligrams. Um, it is quite effective in reducing CME in about 85% of cases, improving vision, and decreasing vitreitis in the duration is about, depending upon the eye and whether or not the protract their eye is vitrectomized or not, about three to six months. There's no tachyphylaxis to repeat injections, so it's equally effective each time. But the cataract, um, it induces cataract and intraocular pressure more often. Uh, one study showed that basically cataract uh, requiring surgery occurs after the fifth injection in, uh, in a large percentage of patients. Uh, you're familiar with the uh, Ozurdex or dexamethasone delivery system, so it's a uh, a different steroid, uh, dexamethasone. This was approved, um, you know, for uh, use in uveitis through the Huron trial. Um, it had efficacy in reducing haze, macular edema, and uh, improving vision as opposed to sham. With you know, at least initially, the, in, where it got approved with minimal intraocular elevation of the pressure and cataract. But this was a six-month trial. Patients that were steroid responders were excluded from the trial, so you always have to kind of wait for kind of post-marketing experience, uh, where the efficacy is actually still um, effective in patients with even greater inflammation that was, uh, that was required for the trial, um, with reduction of macular thickness in patients with macular edema, uh, elevation of the intraocular pressure a little bit more, you know, about 40% uh, about of patients, more, at, at more instance of uh, filtering surgery and cataract surgery. And while the studies uh, show, you know, a, a reinjection frequency uh, of, of, of a mean of about six months, I think in clinical practice most people find that you have to reinject people a little bit more frequently, like more off, more like three or four months. Right. When you're when you're determining whether or not to use.
use something like Osir Dex, like intravitreal versus periocular? Like, what are you thinking about, like, in terms of, like, when would you use periocular versus Osir Dex? Yeah, well, that's actually a good question, and it was something that we attempted to, um, you know, there's a study called the POINT trial, which was concluded, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit, that uh, may answer that question. But in general, okay, I, I am using periocular steroids a lot less frequently than I was previously. I think periocular steroids have a role um, in patients with very mild macular edema that may, for example, be um, uh, macular edema that is perifovial but not quite underneath the fovea, uh, in which you don't, the patient may be adverse to a injection because it is effective. Uh, post, post-operatively after vitrectomy surgery, um, in patients that have uh, vitreous haze with no macular edema uh, and intermediate uveitis, um, that uh, you know it's your first your first encounter with the patient, they may have a little bit of leakage from uh, their uh, on their angiogram. They may benefit from a periocular injection. So that that's what I'd be thinking. But in more severe inflammation, I think uh, you know the more go to is intravitreal. So, um, Ozidex has actually shown efficacy, uh, you know, in the pediatric population, and uh, in uh, it is uh, has a similar dissolution rate in a vitrectomized eye and a non-vitrectomized eye. So, I mean, I think that that is uh, helpful in a patient that has a vitrectomy, for example. <coughs> if you put a uh, intravitreal uh, 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 triacin into their eye, they're going to have the dispersive effect of all this these crystals in their eye and they won't be able to see very well for a day or two or maybe longer, whereas an Ozidex will just be this thing is floating around and they're similarly effective. Um, so regional corticosteroids, the problem, they're relatively short acting, they're less effective for chronic inflammation, so you'd have to continue to, continue to repeat in the injections. Um, uh, there's theoretically, and I think that um, in, in practice, uh, in, with each relapse of inflammation that a patient may have, or with chronic inflammation, there's this kind of sawtooth decline in retinal function uh, with each relapse, or in chronic disease, progressive dysfunction. So you, uh, a, a approach where you're injecting a patient every two months is probably not really a viable approach for chronic therapy. So those patients might need systemic therapy, which we'll discuss. And then, of course, is the cumulative risk of ocular side effects, right, cataract, and glaucoma, and also the cumulative effects of um, endophthalmitis, right, that can happen with each injection. So to your point, uh, Brad, there uh, was a trial that we uh, we were the PIs for here, uh, called the peri- the POINT trial, the periocular and intravitreal corticosteroids for uveitic macular edema trial. Um, so we have the clinical impression that intravitreal therapy may be more effective, okay, than periocular therapy but may have a less favorable side effect profile. Uh, and that Osirdex, the, the impression, clinical impression, is that uh, Osirdex and intravitreal uh, triopsinolin may be similarly effective. But the, you know, uh, uh, the studies that went for the approval of the medication seem to indicate that maybe uh, Osirdex, you know, was, was safer. So a randomized controlled trial was uh, conducted to evaluate, you know, what's the best first-line treatment for macular edema okay, in patients with either inactive or active uh, inflammation. And I don't have time to go through the, all the nuances of that trial, but the bottom line is that all three okay, are effective, but that intravitreal uh, approach is more effective in reducing macular edema, both Osirdex and dexamethasone than periocular steroids. Okay? And that, that was uh, clinically and uh, statistically significant. Um, and that um, that was at the cost of a moderately uh, elevated intraocular pressure rise in the intravitreal group that could be managed with steroids. Um, I, again, this is a pretty short study. Okay? Um, the um, other interesting uh, aspect of this was that the intravitreal dexamethasone, the Ozidex, was not inferior to the um, intravitreal approach. In fact, although it wasn't powered this way or studied, it seemed uh, because of some of the complications of the study design, it seemed that the Osirdex may have a, a non-statistically significant, at least in the study, advantage over intravitreal therapy in terms of efficacy 
The other thing that we learned was the peak efficacy of the Ogedex seems to be about eight weeks rather than 12 weeks. Okay. Um, uh, and that uh, um, intravitreal uh, dexamethasone implant did not seem to have an advantage with respect to uh, intraocular elevation of the pressure. There is another trial that is a sister trial to this with related to macroedema called the Merrick trial that is ongoing. Again, we are uh, the principal investigators for this site. And um, there have been some other non steroidal agents that have been shown to be actually useful in the treatment of macroedema, including anti VEGF agents, both you know, uh, Avastin and Lucentis, and intravitreal methotrexate, uh, which has been used, as you know, in the treatment of intraocular lymphoma, but also in terms of uh, uh, in patients with um, uveitis. And in, and in some, one large retrospective cohort showed that induced a durable remission in about in over 70% of patients. So what is the best treatment? So what, one of the big problems in uveitis is that patients with apparently controlled inflammation can still have persistent macroedema, up to 40% of patients, in fact. And in the MUST trial, 62% um, of the patients in systemic therapy are additional peri periocular or intravitreal injections. So what is the best treatment for patients with controlled inflammation uh, who have already had an exposure to corticosteroids? So your, your choices are give them another steroid in, in the eye or maybe try something else. So that's what we're studying in that trial. Um, for more longer acting uh, steroid delivery, there's the uh, Redisert. Uh, this was approved back in 2005 and it showed definitive efficacy uh, with respect to reduced recurrences compared to the fellow eye, uh, decreased requirement for adjunctive uh, therapy, and improvement or stabilization in, in vision eventually in 80% of the patient, but at the cost of not unexpected frequent uh, ocular complications by marinating an eyeball in steroids for two and a half years. Okay, so this implant uh, you know, will release Lucinolone and setonide, which is moderately potent corticosteroid, for uh, two and a half years. So everybody, in my uh, experience, gets a cataract okay, within a year. Uh, medical therapy is required about three quarters of patients. That's pretty high. And filtering surgery, both in the trials that led to the approval of the, of the um, implant and in the MUST trial, was necessary in 30 to 40 percent of patients. So that's not insignificant, okay? I think that this is a, we'll talk about this and we can talk about it offline, as I say, but uh, I think this is a great device, but it comes at the cost of significant uh, ocular side effects. And um, you have to, this is where individualization is important, okay? So our job, I think, particularly in younger people, is to prevent ocular complications, not create them. Uh, and there is a long-term, people will say, oh, what's the big deal, cataracts and you can always do a cataract with it. I would agree with that. Uh, but there is a big deal about the glaucoma surgery, I think. So there is a long-term risk of that. Um, there is also a flucinolone acetonide insert, okay, which is an office-based delivery. Sorry, the Redisert is a uh, device that needs to be implanted in the operating room. I just, uh, minor detail. Uh, so the patient, <laughs> the patient needs to go to the OR and, you know, there is a... You have to implant this with a, um, you know, parse plane uh, incision into the eye and suturing it into the eye. Um, so it would be great to have a similarly effective uh, implant that you could inject into the office. And indeed, this has been, uh, you know, developed by Alamara Sciences and by iPoint. Uh, the Alluvian implant uh, has been uh, just, it's confusing, but Alluvian was, you know, from Alamara Sciences. This is the implant. Uh, that was um, approved for the use in diabetic macroedema, diabetic macroedema. Um, and the Utique or the iPoint product, okay, has been approved has been approved recently in October for macular for uh, uh, uveitis. So they're slightly different. They're different companies that own them, okay, uh, and there's no indication for the use of alluvian in uveitis, although some people. But now we do have a, a device, as you can see here, which is an office-based uh, inject, injection of flucinolone uh, into the eye, and it's a bioerodible device. That is, 
it can, it's contained in a polyamide cylinder, okay, that uh, elutes uh, in phase one kinetics into the eye once it's injected. So you are left with this little thing that kind of floats around in the eye. It usually lodges in the vitreous. I personally do not have enough experience to tell you whether or not patients see these things or not. But Glenn uh, Jaffe, who pioneered this, has not really had that experience. So it's been, the efficacy of this has been shown in uh, pivotal randomized controlled clinical trials with significant reduction and lowering of recurrence rate uh, as compared to sham, uh, decreased uh, incidence of uh, loss of 15 letters of uh, vision, um, and uh, it allows less adjunctive therapy to be used, but then a higher rate of cataract development. And note, again, this is fairly early. I am sure that you're going to see more cataract development and probably more uh, inter uh, elevated intraocular pressure and glaucoma uh, complications of this device. Just with respect to macular edema, uh, in the uh, one year, 12 year results, um, about 74% versus 48% of patients in sham had resolution of their macular edema. So, as we will see, this may end up uh, becoming actually a very a useful device, but patient selection is really important. Right. So, um, it is the slowest releasing of, of the devices uh, in terms of the steroid, and it, it may be useful adjunctively in the office in patients that, ha that are on systemic treatment that have persistent macular edema, or in patients with moderate inflammation in their eye and unilateral disease, such as a patient with intermediate EBS and macular edema. There is another um, uh, delivery uh, system that is being pioneered, supracroidal delivery of a uh, uh, triamcinolone by uh, ClearSide Biomedical. Um, and there's animal model to support this uh, versus intravitreal injection, that this may uh, you know, give you a higher amount of uh, medication to where you want it, in, you know, to the core and RPE cells, with a lower exposure of uh, medication to the anterior segment. So when you implant a retisert into the, into the eye, it's right behind the ciliary body. Um, so uh, it's thought that location is important with respect to the induction of, uh, of side effects here. Um, I, we have, we're not in this trial, um, but I did try using this device. It's pretty facile. Some patients will um, report some pain associated with this injection by injecting medicine into the supracroidal space, as they do when they develop supracroidal hemorrhages. But um, it's a very uh, actually unique and uh, innovative device. And again, there are, there are phase three randomized controlled trials. NDA has been submitted to the FDA for its approval. We may know by academy of time whether or not this has been approval. And it reached its primary outcome uh, measurement uh, which you know was uh, basically a, a visual outcome, visual acuity outcome uh, of uh, 46 or 47 percent of patients uh, <coughs> versus 50 percent of uh, sham uh, had a, a improvement of 15 layers of vision. Uh, there was also a significant reduction in central macular thickness um, and a, re a reduced uh, re requirement for rescue, that is local steroid rescue versus sham. So sham patients were not, not treated. They were treated with, with periocular or intravitreal cortical steroids. And so far, uh, there's a low incidence of intraocular pressure and cataract. Okay, so far. Stay tuned, right? So systemic cortical steroids are, are, are really the mainstay of severe disease, particularly when it's bilateral. Okay. So, uh, prednisone has a terrible reputation among patients, and maybe people don't use it, but it is a very effective medication when used uh, properly um, and uh, can be uh, used, I think, without creating a lot of the uh, litany of steroid side effects that you would read about if you were to you know, open up the, uh, um, you know, look at all the side effects of this, of this medication. I think that they are manageable and in our clinic we weigh patients, we check their blood pressure, we check their blood sugar and their fasting lipids and get bone densitometry, you know, annually. But we don't have patients on steroids for super long periods of time, right? So we have a defined interval of about three months. We uh, have set goals with the patient in terms of, you know, how much we want to treat them. 
we always supplement them with <coughs> D and calcium because one of the major side effects of the medication is loss of calcium uh, and uh, use anti-resorptive agents as necessary. Um, immunomodulation, uh, immunomodulatory therapy is uh, necessary uh, in patients that uh, fail to respond to corticosteroids, uh, in patients with unacceptable side effects of corticosteroids, um, or um, diseases that are known to be poorly responsive to monotherapy with corticosteroids, and we'll go over some of those. Or when you're tapering a patient off and they get to 20 milligrams uh, of prednisone and they have recurrence. Um, it's just you're not going to gain anything by continuing to elevate their uh, uh, their prednisone uh, you know, continuously and giving them chronic exposure to steroids. You need to add something else in order to spare steroids in the long run. So that's what we're talking about. So there are um, a certain diseases we know that need immunomodulatory therapy at the outset. Okay, that those include Bechet's disease, severe ocular uh, ocular uh, um, uh, mucous membrane pemphigoid, superiginous cordopathy, patients with necrotizing scleritis, uh, and uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. There are some other diseases in which our, the experience suggests that really early implementation, if not at the outset, um, may be beneficial in the long run in terms of the prognosis of those patients. Those include birdshot, multifocal, BKH, in, in certain cases with, with JIA, and some cases with intermediate uveitis. So what are these agents? So I like to think of them, again, because I think I try to be think broadly and stupidly, but in broad categories. So there are so many agents available uh, or coming available. So I think you, one useful way, but particularly reward, is like conventional therapy, biologic therapy. Okay, so conventional, a, uh, conventional agents uh, and biologic agents uh, actually, by definition, modify some specific aspect of the immune system. So conventional agents are more broadly acting. They interfere with either DNA or protein synthesis um, and affect the body, you know, all the cells in the body, like methotrexate, you know, will affect immune cells, but also the gut, okay? Um, other agents will have specific receptor ligand antagonisms, such as IL-2 for uh, cyclosporin. There is receptor blockade, and there are others for which really the anti-inflammatory mechanisms are not quite known. So the conventional agents, again, thinking in broad categories, are the anti-metabolites. Those include methotrexate, mycophenolate, uh, molecule, or cellcept, and azathioprine. The um, calcineurin inhibitors or T-cell transduction inhibitors, such as cyclosporin and tacrolimus. And then the alkylating agents, chlorambucil and cyclophosphamide, which we don't use that frequently these days and, uh, because we have, more, we have alternatives that are not as toxic such as the biological agents. Um, these agents are actually useful in certain disease states um, in inducing remission. And I, to my knowledge, uh, there are not very many agents that actually do that. And the, um, the alkylating agents are the only ones that, that do, really. So for patients, for example, with Bechet's disease, remission and induction has been shown uh, with chlorimacil and, and cyclophosphamide. For patients with necrotizing scleritis associated disease with ankyl positive disease. We do have rituximab, um, but uh, chloramycil and cyclophosphamide have been shown to induce remission. Okay, so treatment principles. You know, you got a fire, you want to put out the fire, okay, with a fire hose, okay, not a squirt gun. And so you want to use a large dose by whatever, as Malcolm X would say, by whatever means necessary. So by whatever route you need to do, to use, um, to put out the fire. And then you want to keep the fire out, right? So you taper, the, taper the, the medication. And then if there's recurrence, think about immunomodulatory therapy. Or if it's a disease you know that doesn't respond well to um, monotherapy, then begin uh, immunomodulatory therapy. So in order to do that, you need to know something about your the drug, okay? So um, using steroids as a bridge is useful in patients, for example, for whom you're going to put on a anti-metabolite because those medications will require two to three months to become actually biologically active. So you want to have something on board tapering your prednisone while 
methotrexate or cell stuff is becoming um, biologically effective. So with uh, immunomodulatory therapy, as opposed to steroids, where we start out with a higher dose and then taper down, we would start out with a moderately high dose and then taper up, okay, uh, while we're monitoring side effects. So we want to closely monitor these patients, um, both clinically to see how they're doing on their medications, and then with laboratory investigations at baseline, um, and at regular intervals to exclude infection, right, and then to monitor the hematopoietic uh, side effects or renal uh, side effects of, depending upon the medication that is used. So for example, cyclosporin, ticyclosporin uh, will produce renal side effects and those patients need to be involved for BUN creatinine, whereas liver function is more important uh, in the anti-metabolites. So there is a very large retrospective <coughs> study called the SITE study that is still kind of ongoing and it's collected a lot of important and informative uh, data from five huge uh, uveitis uh, practices in the United States on the use of these uh, agents. And um, it has shown that basically the anti-metabolites uh, work about 60 to 70 percent of the time. Okay, So that means that you have a fairly high percentage of patients in whom you don't have a, a response. right? And that the remission rate for patients with uh, anti-metabolites is fairly low. Whereas the remission rate for patients with cytoxin is high, higher, however, it comes at a price of significantly higher toxicity. There was a trial called the MUST trial, uh, the multi-centric uveitis steroid treatment trial, which uh, is a very important study that I encourage you to read the, uh, the reports on both their two and seven-year data, which I'll just review briefly here. It was a randomized controlled controlled trial of the flucinolone implant versus standard of therapy, that is steroids first and then the addition of conventional, basically, uh, immunomodulatory therapy to see which, whether, which is better or whether or not there was equivalence. Because a lot of people would say, oh my god, you're poisoning these patients with, with uh, immunomodulatory therapy. And why can't we just, you know, inject something into the eye? So, um, the two-year results showed that both with respect to the implant and to the uh, uh, systemic therapy that the visual outcomes were similar at two years. So this study was designed as a two-year study, but there was follow-up for seven years. I think that's an important point of argument that we can talk about some other time, but the end point of the study was at two years, and it showed similar visual outcomes. Their inflammatory control was statistically significantly better with the implant, okay. but vision was the same. Okay. And systemic therapy was incredibly well tolerated. So we learned some very important pieces of information. So inflammation was slightly better controlled with the implant, vision was the same, um, and uh, patients really did well with, the, with uh, systemic therapy, other than having to have more prescriptions written for infection. So a person's on methotrexate, they get a cold, they go to their GP and they say, oh, you're on methotrexate, here's an antibiotic prescription. So that, that's basically what I'm talking about. But it came at the cost, as I was saying, of significantly in, uh, increased the amount of cataract, uh, IOP requiring therapy, and glaucoma surgery in a large number of patients. The results seven years were interesting. So this is not a designed endpoint, but a large portion of these patients were followed out to seven years. And what it showed was that at seven years, there was actually a switch, okay, to a more favorable response to systemic therapy. And um, I, that switch occurred at about five years, okay? And I, it occurred probably in concomitant with the decrease in the uh, efficacy of the implant. Implant implantation was not required in this trial, although patients were re-implanted, but it was not a requirement. Um, and that um, there was an overall uh, favorable visual outcome uh, in the systemic arm. And that there was a higher proportion of patients that had legal blindness in the implant arm than in the systemic arm. So these graphs kind of show
that um, it, with respect to inflammation, there is a statistically significant difference up until about 54 months. And then, you know, at about uh, five to six years, this switched here, uh, favoring systemic therapy. Both, both groups had anti-inflammatory coverage, which was good, which is probably why the systemic uh, arm did better, because they had, they had continuous anti-inflammatory therapy. With respect to macular edema, not so much, only a statistically significant difference at about six months for the implant, that again switched at about 54 months, favoring systemic therapy. Um, ocular complications, um, you know, as I mentioned to you in the, in the trial at seven years, similar cataract glaucoma surgery, then systemic adverse events were similar as in the two-year study with more antibiotic-treated infections, and similar quality of life for both groups. So what does that mean? You know, I mean, you can interpret this data in two, in two very different ways, but that long-term visual outcome favors systemic therapy versus the implant. And the reason for the, uh, the decreased vision was thought to be the increase in the, in the amount of macular damage in corioretinal inflammatory lesions. There was initial better control with the implant, um, you know, the, initially with the implant than, than later on in seven years, and a, and a greater ocular complication rate as expected with the implant. Um, so I think that, you know, the treatment implications is that Systemic therapy works, okay, that it may be better for a lot of patients as initial therapy, um, uh, but uh, the implant has excellent control of inflammation. I think, again, I would never, I, I, I have, I can think about this data in two very different ways because I think it really needs to be individual, I'm sorry, individualized to the patient. Um, there are patients that are intolerable of corticosteroids, there are patients that um, just don't want to be on systemic therapy, that will do well with this medication. There are patients that have had unacceptable side effects of systemic therapy for which implants are actually very good options. And as I mentioned, the, the, the adjunctive use of uh, intravitreal therapy with more longer acting uh, flucinol may be extremely useful, particularly in patients that are on systemic therapy um, that have recur small recurrences of, say, for example, macular. So biological therapy, the other large arm, they are therapeutic bioengineered proteins that are antagonists against immunoactive molecules. Not that you should memorize this, but this is really what is you know, available okay, these days that we use in patients uh, with, uh, with therapy. So you know, uh, TNF inhibitors, uh, the uh, CD20 inhibitors, IL-6 inhibitors, IL-1 inhibitors, um, they are, we have borrowed really heavily from the rheumatologic uh, literature and from the rheumatologic colleagues in terms of using these medications uh, because they uh, have pioneered the use of these medications in patients with, with um, auditory arthritis. But just to go over the things that you will see most frequently in clinic. So the TNF inhibitors, there are many of them, okay, but the ones you'll see most often are uh, Enbrel, infliximab, and, and adalimumab. Enbrel uh, is, is a uh, uh, recombinant uh, fusion protein that really uh, is great for arthritis, which is one of the first to come out, but it really has been shown to be ineffective in patients with, um, with uveitis. So we will see children, for example, or adults that have inflammatory arthritis that are being treated with Enbrel, okay, that uh, come in for screening, and they may not have any inflammation in their eye. Okay, let's not rock the boat. Okay, you're doing fine. But if you develop, if they developed inflammation, I would switch them to another agent, such as infliximab or adalimumab, uh, which is more effective. Um, a you know, there's evidence-based medicine and there's eminence-based medicine, and so there are these you know, it's hard to conduct large clinical trials, but it is useful to get people's experience. Okay, and uh, particularly when you're trying to get medications approved by insurance companies. So prior to uh, the uh, visual one, two, and three trials, uh, a paper was published in which we had expert opinion with respect to the use of biologic agents. And uh, basically the bottom line was that infliximab and adalimumab are really the preferred first-line agents for Bechet's disease. Okay? Nothing else seems to work very well. 
outreach. That's disease. Everything's been tried, but these agents seem to work well. They are not remittive, uh, but they do get disease under control. And then second-line agents for patients with JA-associated iridocyclitis. And then potentially second-line agents um, uh, when you have failure of conventional uh, immunomodulatory therapy in patients with severe you know, in, intermediate posterior pancreatitis. So infliximab is a, uh, a chimeric uh, monoclonal antibody that is a mouse-human uh, combination uh, that show, it shows efficacy in uveitis with reduced requirement for topical steroids, permits IMT taper, and is differentially more effective than etanercept. Um, the, it is administered by an IV infusion on basically a monthly basis after an induction. Uh, the fact that it's a chimeric antibody uh, uh, is a little bit problematic in that, in that one can develop antibodies to the molecule so that patients that are on this medicine um, usually require concomitant treatment with a uh, antimetabolite such as methotrexate. One of the advantages to using this, this particular drug is in a poorly adherent patient, at least you know that they're getting their medicine, right? So they're coming in for an infusion every month, and then the, <coughs> you, can, uh, it, you, can, you have a little bit more variability with respect to the dose uh, and the frequency with which you administer it. So rheumatologists like to administer this at a much lower dose than for ocular inflammation, three to five milligrams per kilogram, whereas we usually start it out at about 10, and we can go up to 20. And then start at, uh, and then infuse patients on a monthly basis rather than eight weeks, and then extend their infusion interval out. Um, Adalimumab, uh, uh, or Humira, uh, is has been approved by the FDA. is the first biological agent to be approved for use of intermediate posterior pancreatitis, but on the basis of two visual, uh, the visual one and visual two trials, it is uh, fully humanized. Um, so it's less immunogenic, though people do develop antibodies to the medication. It is delivered subcutaneously, so it's a little bit easier to, uh, to administer. And to the credit of AbbVie uh, that um, supports this product, they have a fantastic program for patients in terms of support and use of this medication. Um, we, it's usually dosed every two weeks, although in ophthalmology there are patients that have recalcitrant disease in which we dose them weekly, and that can be a bear in terms of getting that approved. So there, there are some um, concerns with respect to TN, TNF inhibition. Um, the major, I, I mentioned some of them to you, uh, you know, there can be a uh, anti-chimeric antibodies, which can reduce the efficacy of the drug. Um, infrequently, people can develop a drug-induced lupus syndrome, but really, the most important thing is that patients are at increased risk for developing severe infections, particularly TB and histoplasmosis. So any patient uh, that undergoes uh, uh, biologic therapy um, has uh, a screening for uh, tuberculosis with quadriparent mold. There are studies uh, in the literature, depending upon what body of the literature you read, that there's an increased risk of lymphoma in, in, this, in this group of patients, particularly among patients with rheumatologic disease that are already at risk for lymphoma anyway, such as patients with rheumatoid disease. It has not been uh, shown in the GI literature, um, and it's, it's actually a very low rate. There is a, uh, actually increased risk of demyelination, so this is actually an important point, especially with respect to the treatment of uveitis. As um, we uh, maybe touched on uh, last time, intermediate uveitis, uh, one of the major differentials in intermediate uveitis is multiple sclerosis, which can occur uh, in more often in young women that are HLA-DR positive, uh, HLA-DR2 positive. In any case, um, multiple sclerosis is not a diagnosis you make by a laboratory test, right? So, um, but we know that we those patients are at increased risk. So you need to talk to patients about it, and then um, as Intermediate uveitis or pars planus patients are at risk for developing it. Uh, I would not start this without actually screening them 
around long enough to just take a more circumspect approach, and that is kind of wait and see. I would certainly adopt new therapy, but we know that not everybody responds to TNF inhibition, right? So um, there are other biological agents that are available to us that work by different mechanisms. So if a patient doesn't uh, respond to one anti-TNF medication such as adalimumab, you might want to switch them to another one, like infliximab, where you have more um, control over the dosing. There are, there are a couple of other anti-TNF-alpha uh, 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 agents such as golimumab and sertolimizumab, which also may be effective. But there are third-line agents, and we don't really have time to go through them, but they work by different receptor antagonism, such, such as um, abatacept uh, um, or rituximab, which is um, a medication that actually inhibits B cells. Okay? Don't ask me uh, the immunologic exact mechanism of how inhibiting a, a B cell, it, it's complicated, but it, uh, B cell inhibition seems to work in rheumatoid arthritis, in w which is thought to be a more of a T cell mediated disease, but in similarly in certain patients with uveitis, which we think is more of a TH17 or CD4 T cell mediated disease. Um, there are other medications that will inhibit other cytokines, such as IL-1. Um, one promising uh, uh, agent, uh, which inhibits interleukin-6, which is a uh, cytokine which is uh, found in eyes that are inflamed that potentiate uh, the activation of uh, T uh, helper T17 cells, is um, uh, tocilizumab, which is an uh, IL-6 inhibitor. One of the other interesting aspects of this molecule is not only is it is an IL-6 inhibitor, but it also inhibits anti-VEGF. Okay, so um, systemic administration of this medication is not only effective uh, for inflammation, but also for macular edema actually associated with UVS. Um, there was a there is a phase two trial called the STOP uveitis trial, which was a multicenter phase two trial which looked at the safety and efficacy of IV tocilizumab in two two different doses, um, and it showed an improvement of best corrective visual acuity. Uh, decrease in vitreous haze and decrease in macular thickness, um, which was uh, significant, interestingly, in the lower dose rather than the higher dose uh, of this molecule. So this, there, you'll hear more about uh, Actemra or uh, tocilizumab. Just for the sake of completeness, there are other biologic agents such as the interferons. Um, interferon alpha 2A, um, is a, a molecule that can be uh, given uh, uh, three times a week or even weekly, and has been actually very useful in uh, Bechet's disease. In the European experience, it's really not useful here, and actually very useful in uh, recalcitrant macular edema. I, I know of one patient that nothing worked other than this, and that patient's still on interferon alpha. And then IV, uh, IVIG, which has been useful patients with autoimmune retinopathy. Um, so what about the outcomes? You know, um, there is no question that in, in JIA-associated urocyclitis that um, pa treating patients with uh, immunomodulatory therapy decreases the risk of ocular complications uh, and blindness in the better seeing eye. Um, and in the site cohort, which is that large cohort that I mentioned to you, uh, there is a significant decrease in the risk of visual loss, particularly you know, worse than 2050 outcome uh, in patients that are managed with, uh, with IMT. There is a concern for what about, you know, the induction of cancer and mortality. There have been a couple of studies on this, and it's quite interesting, and I think that the information is, is evolving uh, about this. Um, suffice to say that um, the, uh, in the published literature thus far, there is no increased risk of cancer mortality. Um, or cancer risk in, in patients on anti-metabolites um, or um, uh, on anti-metabolites or cyclosporin inhibitors, there is a slightly increased risk uh, of mortality in patients with the um, uh, with um, cytotoxic agents, although this seems to be driven completely by, by chlorambucil. Um, a, a word of caution is that um, and, and then just kind of like hot off the press kind of information is, and I gloss over this, and that the site data 
the initial site data of the TNF inhibition did seem to suggest an increase of mortality and cancer risk in patients that are on biologic agents, although this is a very small number of patients. And that subsequent uh, uh, data has suggested that this uh, does not uh, actually hold true. Okay? Uh, patients that are on uh, immunomodulatory therapy, uh, even patients that are on uh, anti-metabolites are at increased risk of non skin cancer. So you have to advise them about that, and that is also another area of study. So in summary, there are disease-specific indications uh, for treatment. We apply a stepladder algorithm, uh, you know, with the early implementation of uh, steroid-sparing uh, steroid immunotherapy, either as conventional or biologic therapy. And there is definitely a place for, you know, uh, long-acting implantable devices, either as primary or as adjunctive. And hopefully with effective, you know, control, we can modify the prognosis of, uh, of uveitis with the early introduction of these agents. Um, and, I and, I, and I think that will also require identifying eyes that are at the most risk for developing ocular complications and then vigilant post-marketing surveillance with uh, randomized control trials.